Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Let's Take Five. My name is Austin Luger. My name is Eric Martindale. And this is the wrap-up episode. This is the episode we do after we complete a five, and we have now finished the Gene Kelly Five. Obviously, Thank God. our favorite five. <laughs> um, the films we covered the past five weeks are the following. An American in Paris, Singing in the Rain, It's Always Fair Weather, The Young Girls of Rushfort, and the, the surprise hit, Xanadu. Was what we call that a hit? It was a. I mean, it was the only film that. I mean, so far on this podcast, there have been two of the eighty I had not seen before: mm-hmm. Xanadu and Logan. Yeah. Logan, I had a good feeling I was going to like it going again. Mm-hmm. Xanadu, no idea what was happening, any scene, so it was a constant surprise uh, and a hit as well. Yeah, well, it's a hit in the way that you know I thought maybe um, you know if it had a different if if you could somehow. You know, get a different lead in there, a different main character. It would be a, it would be a much, it would be a much better movie. I probably would have liked it, I liked it quite a bit. Because really, thinking about it, he's the only thing in the film I didn't like. I just didn't like him so much. I mean, there are parts that are actually like legitimately bad about the movie. I mean, sure, uh, the the character on paper beyond him is is stupid, and the fact that like his boss, his coworkers. Uh, the existence of higher beings um, are so obsessed with his well-being that uh, I guess I guess what I mean is not so much a different actor, but a different character. Sure, <laughs> everything involving the main character of your movie is terrible. That's not going to make a very good movie. But there was a lot of side stuff going on. I kind of enjoyed. You yeah. know, I kind of like that it was willing to um, look ridiculous. Yeah, I kind of like that about it. And that's kind of why I like a lot of musicals. You know, I I enjoyed the sophisticated. You know, I, I like I like me some Les Mis, yeah. some uh, some company, some Sweeney Todd. Yeah. But I enjoy just the the how strange a musical can be, and how fun it can be, and how much it is like secretly as much of a genre film as fantasy or sci-fi because you're creating something so. Uh, bonkers to reality. Well, I think the young girls of Rochefort kind of did that because it has this really sort of um, surrealist view of this town, and it, 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 they're not really. No one's. It's well, just a day in the life. I mean, nothing seems too dire or too important, except for there's a serial killer on the loose, which is a random, uh, like, plotline age. Um, sure. Not that big of a deal. Um, but I like that about it. But, but, but um, what I don't, or I like, I like it when musicals are like that. So it doesn't need to be so important or whatever. But so it's like I can live with musicals not being lame is, is I guess what I'm trying to say. It's just that um, you know, if I'm not interested, I'm not interested. And you breaking into a song about something I'm not interested about is not going to seal a deal for me. And I think a large part of that is, and you know, I could. I could beat a dead horse for the next 20 minutes, which I'm not going to do, um, because there are five other podcasts prior to this one. I just don't think Gene Kelly is a very good actor, and I and uh, I didn't really like his characters um, that he played very much, because it was all the same. I say character as a character. It was almost the same thing. It's like, I'm going to smile really big, so you're going to forgive me for whatever shitty thing I just did. And then I'm going to dance, and you're going to forget about it. And... I just I, think, I don't let him off the hook like and, that. And like, weirdly, I, I should critique him more, but I, due to the nature of this film, like I really am okay with that. I think in many ways, like for my own personal way, I look at these characters. Like if I'm watching an action film, I don't think that the main action star has a good um, romantic chemistry with like the leading lady. That is far down the list uh, in terms of like. I need to make sure that he can blow stuff up and have banter with the bad guy is a higher priority but for so me. much of his stories revolve around a love story. Yeah, but I mean, that, for, for, that, for, for an action hero kind of thing. I, I found yeah. him charming in these romantic things, and weirdly, a, a Gene uh, Kelly world is like a musical I would like, like to live in kind of thing. Because, Why? Because he's going to win and you're not. That's what I don't but, like about but, it. But his friends are happy at the end always. <laughs> yeah, the rules, that's the thing for me. Donald like, O'Connor is so asexual in that movie, but he's having a great time. You know, but, just, uh, and he's okay, but the, 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 rules are, the rules are too rigged for him. Like, that, that's what, what I don't like. You mentioned the action star. It's like, you know, you want him to blow stuff up well. Well, if you have a romantic lead, and that's what your movie's about, then 
I want you to do love well. <laughs> and a lot of times it's a very one-sided affair with them. But I do appreciate um, Gene Kelly as the, um, almost as the icon more than the actual, like, content that he actually has. Because mm-hmm. I thought the young, I thought the two, I thought the young girls of Rochefort and Xanadu used the persona in a way that made me feel more affection for Gene Kelly. Mm-hmm. Um, the young girls of Rochefort, quite literally, it's like a build-up entrance, and you have this reveal of him, and it's an icon, and that's great, and that's a really cool thing, and I like that a lot. So you have, so you have that, and then, and then again in Xanadu, he sort of plays like the the old Hollywood guy, you know, like, and, and a kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I know he's a clarinet player, but, but it's, it's him playing at being what he used to be, which was Gene Kelly. That's why they make all these allusions to like the fifties and the sixties dancing styles versus what, what exists now. And I like him as that. And I think singing in the rain. And as I've said, that is him on the lamppost is I, is as iconic as the Hollywood sign itself. I just don't like the movies that he's famous for all that much. Um, And a large part of that's because of him. And I think basically for me, he is saving sometimes what are just uh, okay movies. Because even though I was not a big fan of An American in Paris on this rewatch, certain parts did work for me simply because of him and his presentation. When he is going to uh, sing and dance... That's what I'm here to see. It's, it, that's actually above the romance story character. Literally anything else are these moments. And whereas I think a lot of other movies had a lot better collaborators, like a lot of the Astaire Rogers movies, uh, most of the Bing Crosby movies, This is he just has this certain charm about him. And I'm looking at like some of his films, including the, the major one we didn't cover, On the Town. Um, I mean, in that one, it is him, Frank Sinatra, and another guy as three sailors who have a 24-hour leave and they just want to get laid. They don't say that exact phrase because it's still 1950s Hollywood, but that's the idea. And they're they're hound dogs uh, in disguise, basically, as Hollywood romantics. But he's a hound dog there. He is a liar throughout Singing in the Rain, and he's a midlife depression for uh, Toys for Weather, and yet to have that Gene Kelly aura around it actually makes all of those really accessible films that I still find myself rooting for someone whose behavior I shouldn't in a way that you can still like see the flaws but not get buried in them. And that is how sociopaths operate. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Their charisma. Absolutely. <laughs> Their charisma. Absolutely. Like, no, and I donate money to his church. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I um, I just I had to saw that there. I had to pounce. No, I, no, but you, but you're you're right because like I'm not going for <laughs> the character. Study, I'm going for with his his films. I mean, as opposed to the other bastard rays of uh, cinema, I'm going for a really inventive form of escapism. Right. And, it just I, yeah. I, yeah, and it is, the, and that, that that is what it is. And in particular, that time post you know World War Two era, atomic era, you know, I, I can see where that had been popular. It's just that. And it's not even just that. I mean, that that is what it is, and some people like that, and that's fine. But the two most important things to me um, in any story are the plot and the characters. And if I don't like either of those, it doesn't matter how good you dance. I'm not going to. It's not going to affect me. Um, American in Paris had abysmal characters, abysmal plot. Um, Singing in the Rain's got a weak plot with cool characters. Um, you know. It, For the record, I like the plot quite a bit of Seeing the Rain. Yeah. 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 As, as we put down our, our well, thumbs up, thumbs down on plot characters, okay, I, okay. I, I'm, I'm plus characters. Well, plot well, okay, I'm plus. I'm plus on that, actually, now to think about it. I, I, I'm unfair to that movie, actually. I mean, I've been unfair to that movie. That movie's pretty good. The, but it's always fair weather and American in Paris. They just... They don't... I don't know what the themes are, like thematically mm-hmm. speaking. I don't know what it means. You know, you mentioned Les Mis, like oh, like obviously that's a story. That's a story-driven musical, and it works really quite well. And I like it a lot. And the music's great too. Um, but Young Girl or Rashford doesn't doesn't Rashford doesn't have a great plot either. It's just all the characters are so fucking cool, right? That that you get invested in it based on that alone. So that is possible. Oh, absolutely. It's just that 
you can't just dance, which is what American in Paris is. Like, literally, it's like, we've had this kind of weak plot now for the past hour and a half, so now we're going to watch me dance for 30 minutes, and you, and then the movie just ends. It doesn't mm-hmm. even make sense. It's like, why did I watch any of this? What was the point? The, it, it, you know, you dancing for 30 minutes somewhere that has nothing to do with where we're at right now, and then the woman coming up and hugging you at the end of the movie, that's not a resolution. I don't know what that means. You got your denouement mixed with your ending. Like, I, I have no idea what that, any of that was. There was a really cool film that came out five years ago called uh, Girl Talk All Day, because there was uh, this album called Girl Talk, please what it was, um... No, or is it called All Day? Whatever. Uh, it, it it was from that musician who just does so many mashups. He was like with, he's like one of the most beloved mashup artists. Like he would be taking like so many different pop songs, and he had this um, seventy minute album called All Day. And they made a essentially a movie out of that album, and they made characters out of that album. It completely is a mashup of of pop, but they managed to have and this is called the girl, the gentleman, and the creep. And to have them around New York, and the whole movie is just dancing. There's like almost no other dialogue. There are scenes, and it's really cool. But I know I show it to friends. Um, they all kind of want to watch it in segments because they go, "You you can't just dance for seventy minutes." Like I know that there are characters. Now oh, the creeps coming this way. Now it's a, a comedy scene over here, more with Beyonce's song. But no, you can't just do this. <laughs> They're really good, but it's funny how they found that movie weirdly exhausting when it is seventy minutes long. But yeah, no, I mean it. It, it just it, it. It you need something else. You just you just do. And um, for me, actually, you know what? You don't need something else. But f- it's a it's a personal taste thing for me. Say to say that. Um, because if you're just all dance and you're all fluff and you're just dancing and that's what it is, then you're Transformers. Because at that point you're just CGI. It's the new. It's a different way of saying that you don't have any characters and you don't have any plot. You know, it's funny. I, I've now mentioned regret. I think on most of the podcast for Gene Kelly now about you know I want to do a musical set and I, I was worried that Fred Astaire and Gene Rogers films would be too repetitive to do week by week. But now I wonder, like, if we could pull it off because um, while I, I can't remember which one is Top Hat, which one's The Gay Divorcee, each one's funny. I remember I watch one of those, I do laugh, which means it is able to surprise you in a delightful way. And even though those, uh, I guess, probably ten characters of the five Fred and five Ginger mm-hmm. are typically identical, um, I think that there's probably – I think you would – I think it would have been a better five for you mentally. <laughs> uh, for you to go, I enjoyed that film. I don't have much to talk about this time. Um, but I think we, we had a lot to talk about for a, a mixed bag for you and a uh, one disappointment for me. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean... I feel like I'm torturing you. I feel like, you I mean, didn't torture this was, me. This was the, the light after the Russian film. I was going to say, <laughs> I, this is literally right where I was about to go with it. So we just came off of Tarkovsky to this. Yeah. And I think that that makes a... You know that's a that's a good transition. Um, you know it's just I don't. I, I mean I I couldn't have anticipated. I mean I've seen Gene Kelly films. You know like, but to actually sit down and watch him. You know semi critically. You know as far as the show is pretty casual. But I. Where did I, you have more existential dread? Was it with Tarkovsky or with Gene Kelly? <laughs> um. With Tarkovsky. Okay, okay that's yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. I, because, you know, while, while dread, I think, is uh, normally associated with a, ne- a negative connotation, sometimes I think that could be effective in storytelling. Uh, but I just... Gene Kelly, I just... I, and maybe it's because I'm not... A, I, I don't know. Actually, I'm going to stop. I don't know why. I, I don't. He doesn't appeal to me. It's not because I'm a prude and don't like musicals. Mm-hmm. It's just that I think that... Um, I don't think he tells a very good story. And it's so good. I think what he does tell the best is a great presentation. And there is... Like the, also yeah, so no, fast. Uh, <laughs> also fast. Um, there's these set of films called That's Entertainment that uh, MGM made uh, just to really stroke their own egos. Uh, the first one, That's Entertainment, was just a two-hour collection of the best scenes in like, MGM mm-hmm. films, all musicals kind of thing. And I always like, heard about these films as like, these fun like set um, to watch. And I, I finally watched them the other year because they always seem to air on New Year's Eve on TCM. So I 
of course, had them on the DVR for six more months and then finally get around to watching them. But the first one is fine. You know, it's fun to watch the scenes, but it's not edited that well. It does not hold up in the age of, uh, you know, YouTube and a constant diversion of, like, really (laughs) well-edited presentations. And then I have no idea why this happened. Um, There has to be a story behind it. But Gene Kelly decided to direct Dad's Entertainment Part 2, which is essentially a clip show of a studio about themselves. And yet... It became alive. Like this is like the stuff I love to watch. Like a good thing on on YouTube. Um, he made some new videos of him and Fred Astaire doing uh, dancing duets in between them to kind of set up different eras. But the movie actually had a style and a point of view. And I go, oh, weirdly enough, yes, Gene Kelly is the one to direct Dad's Entertainment Part Two. And then of course Dad's Entertainment Part Three was bad again. But that <laughs> that Part Two is now weirdly, I guess, one of the best sequels in Hollywood history because. <laughs> And then, like, I, he didn't have you know, too much of a career. I mean, he did um, Hello, Dolly, which is a... I'm not a huge fan of that musical. I think it has a couple really good songs. But when uh, Dolly gets those big numbers, especially, like, the big outdoor number, that is just Gene Kelly getting to use, like, an even bigger budget than usual. Like, he's using cranes more than he did in, like, any other film of his. And... <laughs> It's crazy. It's an insane amount of extras. That's a, fun, that's a funny thing to say. Right, yeah. Man, he used a lot of cranes. It's a lot of cranes. <laughs> it, it, it just seemed really big, and I found myself like, wow, I'm enjoying the spectacle of this, even though this movie is a bit too, oh, golly gee, I hope she falls in love with me, kind of thing, which uh, gets old for me. But um, uh, so, Sorry, I was a bit distracted while you are doing that, because I realized uh, upon the beginning of recording this... I don't know the order of the five <laughs> for the next guy. Yeah. And uh, I guess that, that was a spoiler there. And I was kind of like, um, I need to figure out the order because we never really <laughs> came to a conclusion on what it was going to be. Well, I mean, I mean, I know the, I know what I'm going to say. So we're live on air. Now I can twist your arm and say the films. I want Well, I thought, I thought we did agree. I mean, I, I just, I, I, I let you do the the replacement because it's your fault. But don't we decide which of the two replacements we are debating? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Is that devil horns? Yeah. Yes, okay, that's the one I, I wanted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Here's another hint. Of what's up to here? I mimed a poke, and then I did devil horns. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so getting to that, just so you can see my confusion. Well, anyway, well, but we, we have ranked it to the well, five. we got to rank the five for Gene Kelly, and then we have the greatest transition we've ever done ever by accident, and it blew my mind. When we're watching Xanadu. Do you like know what I'm referring to? The greatest transition. Yeah. Well, here, well, let's, let's rank the, the Gene Kelly five. Let's uh, get this part of the other way. Yeah, okay. Um, okay I'll, I'm confused at what she said. So. Um, my five would be, from one to five, uh, Sing in the Rain, Young Girls Rush Fort, It's Always Fair Weather, Xanadu, American Paris. But boy, Xanadu almost got third. <laughs> <laughs> because for some reason, the movie's sticking with me. It's Always Fair Weather is a better film. Yes. It is undeniably a better film. But gosh darn it, I want to put on one of those right now. And it's I, yeah, I think yeah, you're probably right. We should we should rank best because <laughs> like this is the first time where my favorite and best may be completely yeah. different. Um, so starting with five, uh, the worst film to me was An American in Paris. Um, <laughs> um, this is the opposite of like no, choosing honestly, your favorite child. It's like what child do I? Want to keep Jesus? <laughs> yeah, and then I'd say you take them all back. I'd say it's always fair weather, yeah, and, then, four. and then Xanadu, um, then Singing in the Rain, and then Young Girls of Rushford. No, which I think I think is the best. Are these the only one film that you would actually recommend to somebody? Yeah, uh, yes, I would definitely do that. I I, I really like that film. I went on that film. I thought it was I, yeah, I thought it was great. Of course, Eric likes the French musical. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I, he, that's the thing. Cause he says I don't like musicals. I loved the one that wasn't even in English. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, you know, that one, I, d- I did not know what you think about it, because it is, I mean, yes, it's on the Criterion Collection. Yes, it is. Uh, also, it's very twee. Yeah. Uh, like, it, b- people can get thrown off by just how uh, colorful and, yeah. and poppy it is. Mm-hmm. But I find it so charming. Yeah, pop my bubble gum, twirl my hair while I watch yeah. it. It's, it. It's great. So, in the movie Xanadu... Um, Transition? What are you talking about? This blew my... Okay, so there's a line that is directly, like, in 
Xanadu and the first film we're going to cover. Oh, God, okay, I got the transition. Yeah, because yeah. there... I thought you were referring literally to, like, shot composition in Xanadu. Like, no, the I transition mean, transition that we have made. never had the fifth of a five connect to the first of a five ever. Yeah, I know. And uh, when they're deciding what to call it, they say that line, which I should have looked up for this, which, you know... The Kublai Khan. Yeah, the Kublai Khan found his great land and he called it Xanadu. Yeah. And this is what Olivia John says out of the blue in a rundown factory, and they go, "Oh, great! Now we got our name for our." Also, none of that has anything to do with Greek mythology. <laughs> no, <laughs> Xanadu, Kublai Khan was, a, I think, Mongolian. Oh, pretty much so. <laughs> okay, I was going to say it was either Chinese or Mongolian. Right. So, so of course that's why they named their uh, crooner rock and roll roller disco Xanadu. Xanadu, um, and but. He, that's the only people who use that exact line to describe a a self made paradise, Xanadu. Exactly. So the transition would be we're shutting the book on Gene Kelly, and we're opening the book with Orson Welles. And I'm sorry, they're still plotting. What? <laughs> the audience are still plotting. Yeah, they're still <laughs> they're still <laughs> plotting your transition. No, we we had a we had a pause there and it was dramatic and they're they're still in awe and they're like. Yes, we're, yes. All, we're all in for yeah, this. Yeah, and, they, and the, you know, Orson Welles, I mean, come on. Where, what, what episode is this? Do you know? Off is the it, top of your head? Yeah, this is well, the a bonus, bonus after 80. So 80, so I mean, it'd be a crime not to have him in the first 100, oh, sure. right? Sure. Okay, so the films we're going to cover are Citizen Kane. I believe this is the order. Um, Citizen Kane, The Third Man, um, Othello, Touch of Evil, and then Chimes of Midnight. Okay. I'm almost positive. Now, what did you think I was going to say? Well, I got confused. <laughs> I, I thought we're not doing Othello. <laughs> no, we're doing Othello. Right. Well, we're doing it now because I, <laughs> I said it on air. No, we're doing Othello. What the when hell? you did Devil Horns, I, I thought we were debating. So this is what the audience listening doesn't know. And right. And this is why this podcast sucks. Well, because, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> no, I, I knew we were thinking in touch of when you did or Devil Lady Horns, I, See, I thought we were debating whether F for fake right. was in... Instead of Lady of Shang, uh, the Lady from Shanghai, or Touch of ah, Evil, I didn't know it could win with Othello because Othello was always in the five. Uh, was it okay? I gotta get Othello. <laughs> yeah, we, we always had, we always had uh, Citizen Kane, obviously the yeah, third yeah. man, Othello, and Chimes at Midnight, and then you said F for Fake, and I was like Lady of Shanghai, and there was like, actually, I think we should do Touch of Evil because right. we're probably not coming back to him. That's true. So yeah, we won't be coming back yeah. to Orson Welles unless we're doing Transformers. Which I've never seen. Which I've dropped twice. I took two Transformers. But I think I think those were two different eras of Transformers. You're different from the animated one, his final movie. I know, yeah. but still, talk right. about it's a it's a it's a it's a year a time of transitioning. Okay, sure. It's we just made the Xanadu transition, of course, which is fantastic. We nailed it, <laughs> and we nailed it. They're still applauding. They can't even. Yeah, hear I know. Right now. They're I know. With it. And then, the, and then the Transformers one. So. Right. Um, obviously, Orson Welles is. Um, I, I th- we're not going to do an episode on F or Fake, but I'm going to recommend everyone watch it because it's insane. And we'll like, discuss it on the bonus review. <laughs> As a casual, like, holy shit, what did he do? <laughs> Maybe the bonus review. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it too because I haven't seen it. So. I, don't, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so... It's his last thing, right? Other yeah, the last thing he directed. Okay, last um, thing he directed, yeah. And it was going to be like a new way of like, I'm going to make these really bonkers, like documentary essay films and this is like the first one it was going to be and then like he died um and it's really fucking weird <laughs> and it's bonkers and awesome and <laughs> all every, it, it, it's so much about late era <laughs> Orson Welles in just a really uh weird way well Orson Welles is um inevitable on a yeah, on a film podcast. I mean, if there's a film podcast that's existed longer than 100 episodes and they haven't talked about Orson Welles, right. you should probably cancel your subscription. And this is podcast. not your topic at all. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's if it's about reviewing, as we say, you know, the wait, greats wait, of cinema. Wait a second. Okay. Are you about to embarrass me? Don't embarrass me. you got a face that you're making like... It's no. radio, not television. No, I'm thinking because episode 100 of The Immortals came out. We haven't covered Orson Welles yet. <laughs> I can you're telling me to cancel. <laughs> well, that's different because it's a randomizer. I, I, okay, this is bad. I, I've gone down a, a slippery slope here. Have we not Simpl- seen him in anything? Oh, no. He was, uh, he can be in the Muppet movie. Okay, we've, we've had one Orson Welles film. <laughs> God. I mean, no. I, I, 
it, uh, what I meant to say by that had nothing to do <laughs> with shots at the podcast so much as it had to do with like I got nervous the importance <laughs> of Orson Welles. I could tell you look scared. Yeah, you look like a deer in headlights. I, I felt embarrassed for you. I was, love the movie. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's it. I don't have anything else to say. I'm excited because he is someone who, by all accounts, I mean he kind of peaked with his first film because it's still considered perhaps the greatest film ever made um and yet his career is really interesting in a way that like <laughs> his his ego was attacked by his own studio and like he became um a proper independent film director mm-hmm. for for better and worse because sometimes he was able to make something really incredible and then other times um it was a mess and but he still had really curious ambitions throughout his entire career um, that doesn't always reflect the youthful ambitions of Citizen Kane in terms of structure, but just man, he's he's a really curious one and yeah. I mean, also that's a man with a, a lot of charisma, he's probably a sociopath <laughs> well, he's also a um, renaissance man of the arts I mean, sure. it's not just, he's not just a great director he's a great writer, he's a great actor, actually his I think his acting's underrated Mm-hmm. Because people look at him as just like a filmmaker, I think, in general. Orson Welles was, especially for the time and the style of acting, this is before your early method actors of you know Brando and oh, sure. Paul Newman and Liz Taylor. He's incredible yeah. for that era. He's better than anyone on the screen with him, always. And I think that's kind of, that's, that's kind of swept under the rug a little bit. It's, my God, he was a great actor. So, anyway... So I'm excited. We got uh, we have five great ones again. Um, so we have coming up just to repeat because we added just uh, seven bonus episodes. They're casual. Yeah. Uh, we have Citizen Kane, a third man, mm-hmm. Othello, mm-hmm. Touch of Evil, mm-hmm. Chimes of Midnight. Yeah. At least we broke up our Shakespeare's. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this Friday in two days we're going to have our episode about Citizen Kane. It's a good get your whole family around after Thanksgiving. Just a. Uh, Sit down by the fire and listen to us talk about a movie. It's okay. The movie or our podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> you know where to find us. Arkhamore.com. Leave a comment. Uh, you all are great. He's on Constant Diversion on That's YouTube. Right. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Austin Luger. I'm Eric Martindale. Bye. Bye. I guess of all the people here tonight, it is... I, who has been closest to Gene throughout the years. I remember it was the early 50s, and Gene and Stanley Donan were directing a film, and I dropped by to see my pal Gene. And they were very glum and kind of depressed. I said, what's the matter? And they said, this damn weather. We can't get this number shot. I sat there for a minute and I said, why don't you shoot it anyway? Stanley Donut said, get him out of here. I don't want this guy around. Well, the rain kept up. And Stanley said, what the heck? We'll do what Steve said, we'll shoot it anyway. Let's just get this lamppost out of here and we'll be ready to go. I said, leave the lamppost. (laughs) Gene said, Steve, but what'll I do when I get to the lamppost? I said, swing around it a couple of times, make it like a big deal. (laughs) The rest is history. That film was on the town. The number was cut from the film, and Gene never spoke to me again.